This will be followed by an account of the rehabilitation program for those who had been forcibly recruited by the Tigers, children for whom in those terrible days the international community did little. Over 4,000 recorded violations of child recruitment even after a so-called ceasefire agreement had been signed. Finally, there will be an account of one of the quickest demining programs after a conflict, which has permitted almost all the displaced to get back home safely. I should note that, though the lead was taken by the military, all this work was done in cooperation with the civil authorities to whom the servicers were accountable. In looking after and then resettling the IDPs, the presidential task force was the main authority, but it was remarkable how well the official forces worked with local officials, in particular the government agents who had functioned so effectively through the warriors, even in areas under the control of the tigers. And I'm delighted to see here today the government agent for Jaffna, who was government agent for Mulatibu during the conflict, who risked her life so much to serve her people and our people. We were occasionally informed that our forces had hurt her, that she was about to die, and we would ring up desperately to see how she was, only to find that she was far away on circuit, not where she was supposed to have been hit, according to the Tamil Net reports, but working tirelessly for the people, which she continued to do, as did all her colleagues in the service. For rehabilitation, Imelda, would you stand up? And she's, she's not the only one, but she perhaps ran the greatest risk. For rehabilitation, work is through a ministry, the Ministry of Justice earlier, and now a dedicated Ministry of Rehabilitation and Prison Reform. I have been asked by some members of the international community why military officers occupy what are considered civilian positions. The answer is very simply that we need efficiency. And as yesterday's descriptions made clear, our services have been trained to function effectively in a way that sometimes those with a lesser sense of urgency cannot achieve. That was the most tactful way I could put it. The speed with which demining was done by military teams, for instance, contrasts favorably with the record of the various organizations to which demining had been entrusted previously, and it should be noted, with no disrespect to those who do a tough and thankless task, that accidents last year, very few, in areas that had been cleared, occurred in places demined by organizations, not the military. And the accomplishments with regard to rehabilitation by the present regime, as compared with long delays in previous years, testifies to the continuing capabilities of our services even after the military campaign was concluded. But we must also make clear the contribution, conceptual as well as practical, of civilians to these processors. I will therefore ask the members of the panel, too, to make brief presentations themselves on their work after the officers have finished. Dr. Safras will speak on the massive efforts of our medical officials. He's a civil doctor now working with the military, uh, for the Commissioner General of Rehabilitation into restoring and preserving the health of the displaced. Dr. Shantikumar will talk of our efforts to rebuild communities amongst those whose social structures had been shattered by terrorism. Mrs. Etterachi will describe the survey of the former combatants so that we would be able to serve their individual needs, while Dr. Sushila Raja will discuss the psychosocial counseling that we have introduced. Finally, and I must apologize to my fellow Sri Lankans for saying this, since it is part of our normal life here. I should note that our panel includes all the main Sri Lankan communities and religions, Buddhist and Christian and Muslim and Sinhala and Tamil. Those of you from the full international community may not notice this. So I should point out that in the world of work and professionalism, we can and do all work together in this once and future prosperous, pluralistic society, Sri Lanka. I would like first to ask Brigadier Apuarachi to talk of the way we looked after the displaced. He is the present Brigadier coordinating the Defence Services Command and Staff College. He enlisted in the Army on 25th May 1982 
and co was commissioned to the Corps of Engineers. He has been on several training courses, both here and abroad, and has not only worked in the field, but has also worked in education, in particular as Chief Instructor of the Military Academy at the Atalava. And he was there when our university was asked to coordinate the degree program of that academy uh, at a time when the army, despite the difficulties of the, of the terrorist threat we faced, decided to upgrade its training programs. And the cooperation that the university received in those days was terrific. He himself has obtained a master's degree in business management from the University of Rajaratha in Mihintale, and he was awarded the elite Ranasura Padakkama for bravery in the battlefield and also received eight other medals for meritorious conduct in the army. And he also is recipient of the President's Medal at the Military Academy and a gold medal for his Master of Business Administration degree at the University of Rajarata. It's with great pleasure that I ask Brigadier Hapuarachi to speak. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Sri Lankan security forces fought against brutal force of terror for 30 long years and adopted a different approach with the end of the terrorist campaign. The world's largest rescue operation in living memory was launched with a strategy to ensure that the people will experience no longer the smell of death, destruction, and desolation, but future of hope, prosperity, peace, and reconciliation. Approximately 300,000 citizens of this country made their exodus from the iron fist of a brutal LTT force. Many cynics note that this war with, would be a without witness, but battle was witnessed by the none other than the civilians and ex-combatants themselves not the virtual cynics who speculated so-called bloodbath. When security forces launched the humanitarian operation year 2007 to liberate innocent civilians who were held hostage by the LTT, a parallel operation was executed to ensure the safety of civilians who were either rescued or escaped from the LTT risking their own life. This parallel operation to was conducted as per the instructions and the guidance by the then Security Forces Commander Vanni, the present commander of the Army. The operation has three stages, rescuing civilians and receptions of IDP in the first stage, administering IDPs in the second stage, and resettlement of IDP in the third stage. The rehabilitation of the combatant who was executed parallel to this operation. An elaborate plan was drawn up to receive the IDPs who were rescued from the LTT as per the instructions given by the Security Forces Commander. Those instructions are as shown on the screen. Ensuring zero vulnerability of civilians to LTT direct and indirect fire during the reception. Provision of water and food on reception, provision of medical care if required on reception, transportation to safe areas after reception. On receipt of these instructions, headquarters, Ford maintenance area formulated a plan to establish a mobile reception center very close to the forward most line of combat troops. It is also pertinent to note that every steps were taken to prevent LTT carders entering mingling 